My name is Daryl Markowitz and I'm joining you all from Ontario, Canada. I'm located about two and a half hours northwest of Toronto. Um, I've been working with iron smelting since about 2001. My main concentration has been Viking Age. Um, I've been asked by Paul to uh, do a short lecture today um, concerning the spread of uh, Viking Age iron smelting technique from the homelands of Norway eventually all the way over to Vinland um, in the lands of meadows. I'm going to be using um, Norse to define um, the Scandinavian culture, um, concentrating on Norway as the specific homeland. Those are the people who actually traveled uh, across the North Atlantic. Viking Age I'm just going to loosely use the uh, numbers 800 to 1000 AD. We're all aware that this is a definition by the English. It's not actually how the Scandinavians describe this time period. Obviously, Scotland and Ireland come into the mix here. Um, the first settlements, permanent settlements, in Ireland start about 840 AD. And eventually, the Norse will travel to settle Iceland in around 870 and from Iceland there are voyages to Greenland with the establishment of a colony there and then eventually to Vinland itself um, approximately 1000 AD. Now of course when we're looking at the past we have the limits of archaeology that define what we know. First of all there are the remains of literally tons and tons of iron smelting slag found all through the Scandinavian world. Um, of course, the slag is a glassy material. It's almost indestructible in the archaeology. This also extends to the actual furnace bases themselves. And what I'm talking about here are the slag bowls that would be in close proximity to the bloom. Often, as this one, you can see a hollow space where the bloom was extracted. In terms of the actual furnaces themselves, beyond the bases, it's very rare to find any superstructure. This is because the materials used, clay primarily, um, just don't survive in the environment over time. Blooms, there are very few of them. The blooms themselves were a valuable commodity. A huge amount of work went into creating a bloom, and of course the bloom was not the final product. The desired object was actually a currency bar, which is what the iron smelting masters would have been selling. We have a problem in deciding how the air was supplied. There's no existing bellows that has been found as an artifact from the Viking Age. In fact, what we have are two small illustrations. This wood carving from the, the church in Norway is perhaps the one best known. Another thing we have to consider when we're looking at the remains of iron smelting is the difference between farm iron smelting and what I would call industrial iron smelting. Individual family farmsteads would often smelt iron on a seasonal basis, but then there are sites where literally hundreds of iron smelts were done end to end by groups of individuals producing iron as a commodity. And of course, there's no living tradition of these iron smelting techniques that extends up into the modern age. By the time we get into the medieval period with the incorporation of water power, the production of iron itself changes several times even during the medieval period. So when we're looking at um, Scandinavia, what does a basic furnace kind of look like? And I loosely call all the Scandinavian furnaces short shaft. Um, the height of the individual furnaces is kind of in the range of one meter or perhaps a little bit less. All of these furnaces are using forced air of some kind. There's a bellow systems involved to provide air to the inside. They're, they're not using a passive system of any kind. Primarily Scandinavian furnaces tended, from the Viking Age at least, tend to be slag tapping furnaces. All the Scandinavian furnaces are using some variation on a primary bog iron ore as opposed to um, an excavated rock ore. One of the questions remains about extraction. Some furnaces, like this one from Norway, are clearly 
um, designed to be extracted from the bottom. Others, because of the build, obviously had to be extracted from the top. In all cases, the individual furnaces are constructed of locally available materials. And this is going to change the types of furnaces we're going to see across the North Atlantic. What kind of furnaces started in Norway? Of course, there's a tradition, um, a long archaeological history of ironworking in Norway. One of the problems is trying to define to the Viking Age. So what do we find? What I call stone infill. So they, these would be um, medium-sized stones that are bound together um, by a thicker circle of clay. Obviously, these are going to be more industrial furnaces and top extractions. There will be some kind of combination of uh, major stone blocks put together or stone slabs uh, joined in um, a rough rectangle. And we also find um, a rectangular stone slab with um, a circular clay inner liner. Um, this uh, furnace, as you can see, is, is obviously designed for top extraction, but is a slag tapping furnace. You can clearly see the slot in the side. So when these folks traveled to Iceland, they would bring those iron making systems with them, that tradition of iron making. Now the biggest problem you know, with Iceland is there's no real clay there. There's marl, a kind of sticky mud, but no clay. Um, another thing that messes up our uh, understanding of what happened in Iceland is there's only two sites that have actually been uh, published in the academic press. Both of these are architect architectural, or sorry, industrial sites. Um, there is a, a current publication going on on a third site over to the west of the island, um, which is a farm site, um, but it hasn't been officially published yet. So. What are we going to, going to see? Of the two main sites we can look at, one is Skogar um, in the north, and uh, what we see here based on the archaeology um, are uh, a combination of uh, a stone base with some kind of shaft on top. Probably uh, grass turf, but it isn't entirely clear from the archaeology. The second large site at a place called Halls in the, the central part of the island on the west side, um, another um, industrial site. Halls has cones made of strips of grass sod, um, probably surrounded by a, a box. And again, there's multiple furnaces at this site. There's some evidence that there may have been um, a thin marl clay liner. When we travel next, even further westward to Vinland, what we find are the remains of a single smelt attempt. This was likely intended to be a resource test. They would have uncovered bog um, or when they uh, dug up the turf blocks to build the houses. Um, the smelt itself is very small. It has an extremely low yield. It really has the signs of not being iron masters who did this smelt. The evidence suggests that what we have, again, is um, a series of small stones to make a base with a clay shaft above that. Um, there are some fragments of clay found, and uh, there is a source of clay within about 500 meters of the site. So applying this backwards, how are we going to take that and um, what we did in terms of experiment? Um, and I like to call the, the first things we did up here, the first um, roughly 25 smelts. Or, or, well, that didn't work. Um, we went through a long series um, of attempting individual variables to find out what would create a good working system. Um, primarily, we have focused our work around a short shaft, um, idea of about uh, 30 centimeters and about 60 centimeters tall. These have primarily been slag tapping furnaces, although we have done experiments with slag pit as well. Um, our standard is a clay cob, a mixture of one-third clay, one-third beach sand, one-third finely shredded uh, dry horse manure as an organic. 
Um, we've repeatedly worked with uh, standard ceramic terrain basically to, to give us uh, a predictable result. And uh, we found that setting the terrain angle at 22 degrees down between 20 and 25 is the ideal. Thanks to Lee Sauter, we later have switched to use of uh, uh, copper, forged copper terrain. We've consistently used a high volume electric blower. Um, this is primarily to get around the labor problem of assembling a team to use a human powered bellows. Although we have done a number of smelts using uh, human bellows power as well. <clears throat> now one of the problems we have here in Gray County where I live is we're on top of um, the Niagara Escarpment. It's a giant block of limestone about 450 kilometers long. So there's no actual iron ore here. So we developed uh, an analog. And um, the chemistry here was based on the uh, finds from Lanza Meadows. And uh, at core, it's uh, Spanish red iron oxide, Fe2O3, um, mixed with 10% whole wheat flour. And we'd done this originally to match the chemistry from Lanza Meadows. The flour acts as a binder. So you mix it up um, as a paste about the consistency of peanut butter, and then you leave that out in the sun to dry. And uh, the resulting mix gives you about a 60% iron content, um, a good, rich, predictable ore. So um, related back to our ecological samples, um, what have we done that relates to Norway? Now, uh, we haven't primarily looked at Norwegian furnaces and trying to recreate them. What? As part of our series based on the Icelandic furnaces, we did do several stone bills. One of the problems we have here is our stone here is a particularly cruddy type of limestone. Limestone completely unsuitable for building furnaces. So we have to grab bits and uh, pieces of stone from further north where there is granite available. Um, no basalt, by the way, in this part of the country. Um, so the first furnaces we ex uh, experimented with were uh, stone slab, which results in a rectangular box shape and any of you that work with rectangular realize that there are dead corners in the back of the uh, furnace. You get a D-shaped burn pattern from the air insertion from the terrier. Um, we've also worked with a fairly ugly stone block using clay as a kind of mortar. And um, you can see uh, a fairly recent uh, furnace using that. And this is a granite um, landscaping block that I actually had to purchase um, what we found right off the get-go is not all stone is suitable for building furnaces. And number two, building with stone, as you can see in this image, takes a particular set of skills, which I certainly do not have. So we had done a long series of work with the Icelandic build based on Kevin Smith's work at Halls. And um, looking at the archaeology, um, you can see here what we think happened at Halls. Um, the cone made of the, the cut turf blocks surrounded by a wooden box uh, filled with dirt to give a flat working platform. Um, this is a particularly massive physical build about two meters by two meters and uh, what we ended up doing is actually cheating and um, digging in the space um, into the side of a small hill at our smelting area. We ran a total of eight experiments um, to try to get this, in the end, doing a full build using grass sod. Um, certainly what we found was this system of using grass um, sod to construct the furnace is perfectly functional. The One of the last furnaces we did, there was no clay liner to this at all. The Just a cut through a pile of, of grass sod would hold together long enough, at least for a single smell. We've also done a long series based on our work with Parks Canada at um, Lanza Meadows, um, the historic Vinland. Um, this largely had to do with not so much designing a workable furnace, which we certainly knew how to do by this point, but how the space would work. Um, at Lanza Meadows, there's a cutout into the side of a hill about two meters by two meters, and we arranged our equipment based on the hints from the archaeology. We did a total of five experiments. The last one ended with a smelt at Lonsa Meadows itself in the re reconstructed um, 
furnace hut um, on the site. Um, we've done two there, 2010 and 2017. So all of this work, what does it give us? And what would be the conclusion I would want to stress for you? First of all, if you're actually trying to experiment and find out how things work, you have to develop some kind of a repeatable system. And I can't stress how important record keeping is. When we're having conversations with new people starting out or people in the academic community, um, so often their basic question will be, what went wrong? And unfortunately, so many details are never recorded. The actual um, charge times would be one example. Um, often people will not um, tell you know, what kind of terrier they're using, what the angle it's set at. Um, these are critical things to success in your smelt. So I would really, really stress developing some kind of standardized note taking. Think about how that information could be shared to others. And certainly photography is incredibly valuable to you. If you have somebody taking photographs of what you're doing, if you miss writing it down, sometimes you can get it back by looking at your photographs. So I would invite you to uh, take a look at all the documentation we provided on our iron smelts um, on the website. Um, all the work that I've done has been done with the help of my Viking Age Recreation Group, Dark Ages Recreation Company. Um, they have their own website where they document the, the iron smelting. And um, my direct email is provided here at the bottom, info at wearingforge.ca. And please, I'm happy to talk iron at any time. I'm somewhat upset that I'm not going to be able to get to see so many of you that are old friends and meet so many of you. Um, that have corresponded for years over email and let's hope that next year we can all get together in Ireland and enjoy this great event.